Okay, we are going to get started now. Uh, my name is Stacy Kleesh. I'm a past president of, of AIA New Jersey and the current chairperson for the AIA New Jersey Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion Committee. I am thrilled to have our audience here today to join me for our uh, Black History Month Lunch and Learn program. We today are featuring a interview with Sydney Nance, who is the Associate of the Year for AIA New Jersey. She is going to be telling us about her um, history, what she's currently doing, and what her plans are for the future. Sydney Nance, an emerging architectural professional, holds a Bachelor of Architecture degree from the Hillier College of Architecture and Design at the New Jersey Institute of Technology. Currently, she contributes her expertise as part of the business development team at Henning Larson in New York City. Additionally, in her spare time, Sydney volunteers as the editorial assistant to Madam Architect, a media startup focused on sharing the narratives of women in architecture and design. Driven by her passion for increasing diversity in the field of architecture, Sydney advocated for her peers through her involvement in the American Institute of Architecture students and other organizations. In her final year as an undergraduate, she served as chapter president of AIAS at NJIT and has since served on the National AIAS Honor Awards Jury. Sydney, thank you so much for being here today. Welcome. Great to be here. Thank you everyone for joining. Sydney, can you tell us what your feelings are about being recognized by AI in New Jersey as the Associate of the Year? This recognition is really important to me. I'm really happy that I received this honor um, because last year my mentor, Melissa Nieves, actually was the recipient of this award. Um, and she has been so amazing to me. Um, I met her through NJIT's EOP program which is a uh, summer program that helps incoming freshmen to um, learn about their different majors. So she was my architectural tutor and she helped me break, at, break out of my shell a little bit. Um, and she helped me all throughout college as well. So to follow in her footsteps and have won the same award is huge to me. And then also we have, um, we both were nominated by Andrew Thompson, who's an AA New Jersey, superstar. Um, so it's, it's just a privilege to have this honor. Wonderful. That sounds terrific. Um, can you tell us about some of the advocacy efforts that you made with AIAS while you were at NJIT? Well, in the AIAS uh, NJIT chapter, I started, I started out as a supply shop manager and AIAS NJIT is really interesting as a chapter because they have these student services that are um, completely run by the chapter, and we manage our um, our school's print shop, uh, 3D printing lab, and also um, a supply shop. And so those services are really helpful to the students within the school and um, give them the resources that they need to get their coursework done. So starting out as a volunteer, I moved on the following year to becoming um, the supply shop manager. And then the year after that, I really got going and I was um, professional development director. And I really loved that role because I was able to expose students to different firms. Um, and we have firm tours where we visited different places in New York City. Um, and I was actually professional development director during COVID. So I had a really unique situation where I had to do a lot of things virtually. Um, so I, one activity that really stuck out to me was I uh, set up a panel of different um, architects within the industry, um, notably Abigail Benjamin, who's also on AA New Jersey um, committees. And um, we were able to engage students from around the country actually to be on that panel and, um, and meet these different architects. Um, and then following that year, I ran for chapter president, which um, if anyone knows me, I'm very shy and um, I can be really introverted. So stepping into that role was um, was definitely interesting for me. But 
Well, congratulations on making those great strides during your time at school. That's really impressive. Thank you. Um, what would you say was your defining moment during your presidency as the chapter president for AIS? Yeah, as chapter president, um, a lot of things stand out. Um, like I said, our chapter is really unique um, in the sense that we run these different services, but we also have several committees. So our board of directors actually ends up being around like 20 to 25 students every year. So I was in charge of delegating to all of these different students and managing all of these different committees. Um, so two things definitely really stand out to me. Um, the efforts of our professional, oh, not our professional development committee, but our freedom by design committee, which allows students to um, basically design themselves. It gives them the opportunity to provide services to the community and really engage with um, their local environment. Um, and so our Freedom by Design Committee was able to put together a parklet and they built um, this wooden structure on our campus for different students to interact with and the public to engage with as well. And they essentially created public space on their own just through this organization. And they also um, put together a Kit for Kids program, which is a program we've ran um, almost every year, except for during COVID, um, where they interact with middle school students and teach them the fundamentals of design. So that was a really, really big thing that year because we brought that back to the campus since I was president following COVID. Um, and so we were really getting back into things and having more in-person events. Um, and then the other thing that stands out to me is the number of students we were able to get to attend our grassroots conference, which is a national AIS conference that's hosted every year in Washington, DC. Um, and we were able to get 10 students to attend that conference and we were able to sponsor them. So it's, it's really, I think what's really important about these organizations is providing opportunity equity and allowing these students to, to do things without having to pay so much. <laughs> to get these experiences. So I, I love that about being president. Excellent, excellent. Uh, Freedom by Design is a longstanding AIS national initiative. Uh, for those on the call who may not be familiar, can you tell us a little bit about what that program could entail and how students get involved? Yeah, Freedom by Design, like you said, is a national uh, initiative and Students can get involved within their chapters. Um, every chapter does different initiatives, but it's really an effort to allow students to, it really pushes students to build their own, um, their own projects. So other, other schools have done um, a variety of different things. I know another school has built like a part of a playground. And um, what's great about it also is that the national, um, the national board gives out grants that are also um, sponsored through different um, architectural organizations. So they'll send the chapters um, grant money to get their projects done, which is amazing. So the park project that your chapter took on, that was um, Newark city land? Yes, yeah. Um, so that it was a tough um, initiative to, to get done. Um, we originally wanted the parklet to be off campus within the Newark environment. And I think actually now they're, they're working on another parklet where they'll, they'll be engaging with the city of Newark. But our parklet ended up being on the NJIT campus, but it's open to the public. Um, so essentially a parklet, the idea of it is that it takes up a parking space. And so it gives space back to people um, you'll see a lot of them in New York City where restaurants have their seating now. And it's taking up all of these different parking spaces. So we built our own on campus um, and that was run by Drewby um, and she she helped lead the efforts for that as well. So when, when we're visiting NJIT, where should we look for this parklet? Where is it located? The parklet has been dismantled now, um, but <laughs> it was on campus last year. Um, and they dismantled it for the winter. And I'm pretty sure um, you'll hear about it soon. They're, they're moving it to a different location um, and building it for another organization as well. Excellent, great. Thank you for that update. Um, 
Were you able to advance equity in your role as a juror for the National AIS Honor Awards? I would say so. It's it's pretty tough to <laughs> to to think about that to say that I advanced equity. Um, but what was great about that jury was we all were from very diverse backgrounds. Um, we a lot of us were of minority backgrounds as well. Um, so to have such a diverse jury um, to review all of these different projects was was really great. Um, and I was selected to be on that jury by a past. Vice President of AIS, her name is Shannon DeFranza, and I really admire that she was able to pull together um, such a diverse jury. Um, and I loved that time because we were able to uplift different uh, students and professionals. Um, a little bit about the Honor Awards, it publicly recognizes the achievements of students and educators and practitioners that have uplifted different architecture students and helped advance the architectural education and development of students. So what year uh, were you on that jury? I was on that jury and oh gosh, I believe it was 2022. So, oh, well, 2022 to 2023. And can you tell us what projects you ended up recognizing if you recall? So off the top of my head, um, cause it was quite a while ago now. Um, one that really stands out to me, and I wasn't actually allowed to speak on this, but um, we, <laughs> I wasn't allowed to um, participate in this part of the jury, but we honored um, Drew V, who is the Freedom by Design um, director during my time as president. So I was really excited about that. And we also honored our Freedom by Design committee. So that That's was fantastic. Big, Congratulations. Big for me. Thank you. Uh, so being on the jury, uh, what? how long does that last and what are the responsibilities and what school did you have to travel or was it virtual? It was all virtual. Um, and so we met with, I can't remember how many jurors there were, but we met on a call um, every few months. Um, and it lasted, it lasted a good amount of time, I believe around six months. So we, we were given all the materials of the submissions from um, the award submissions, and we reviewed them on our own time and scored them um, in a spreadsheet. And we would meet um, with the past vice president of AIS and the current vice president to deliberate on the different awards. Um, so it was definitely an extensive process, um, but it's a really important one. And I, I really admire the way um, they pull in different jurors from all these different backgrounds. Well, that must have been a very exciting experience for you. It was, yes. I'm glad you had that opportunity. Um, okay, so let's switch gears now and uh, take a look at your uh, work in practice right now. Tell us about your role as business development team at Henning Larson, because I think that's a unique one for someone uh, with your, um, you know, as a recent graduate. Uh, so what does that look like? How did you end up in that position and what are your responsibilities? Yeah, so at Henning Larson, I'm the business development and marketing coordinator, and I work with a really great team. Um, and what's great about Henning Larson is a lot of um, the office is also involved in business development initiatives. So it's not limited just to my team. Everyone gets really engaged in the process um, and really cares about getting new pursuits and then also um, engaging with different conferences and speaking engagements. Um, so a little bit about how I got there. I used to work for Studio 1200 and I was an architectural associate and I also managed our materials library. And I really loved my role in the materials library because I was able to engage with different vendors and hear them talk about their different products and, um, and just go in depth about their different companies. So I think that really sparked my initial interest in business development, just hearing them like, get out to our firm and talk to us about their business. And really, they were all really passionate about the products that they have. Um, so later I transitioned into a role um, as business development coordinator at Henning Larson. Um, and then also for those who aren't familiar with Henning Larson, we're a global firm with Danish roots. We originally started in Copenhagen 
and still have an office there. And we have, I believe, six offices globally. Um, and we focus heavily on sustainability and architecture at a human scale. So it's it's really a great firm, and we have really passionate people that that work for the firm. And our New York office is still fairly new, um, and so we're still trying to get our footing in the United States. But it's a great place to be. How long have you been there? I've been there since December, so I not not too long, but. Very new, exciting. Yeah. Um, yeah. And how does this tie into your um, accreditation or your AXP or whatever you're working on for right. licensure? Yeah, so I've done a fair amount of my hours for AXP already. And so this applies to, oh gosh, you're like putting me on the spot with the NCARB <laughs> criteria. <laughs> no, you're saying. <laughs> Um, but there is a component of your NCARB hours that relates back to business development and marketing within a firm. And I believe that's around 160 hours. Um, so it, it does apply to that as well. Um, and what's also great, I forgot to mention about our business development team at Henning Larson is that we have, we all have a background in architecture. So within the team, which I think is a little unique for certain um, firms. So Henning Larson really has a heavy design mindset and we like we really engage all of that within our business development process as well. I do agree. I think that's a unique model. Most of the firms that I'm familiar with that have a dedicated department, uh, the people are, you know, maybe have no architecture background, maybe right. they're from a marketing background or something like that. So I think it's, um, first of all, I think it's probably a great idea for the firm to have people who really have a design mindset in that role. Yeah. But I also think that uh, the most successful firms really engage everybody in the firm in some level of business development and to always, um, you know, have your marketing hat handy, even when you're out, you know, uh, meeting with a, a prospective client or at a planning board meeting or whatever the case might be, because you never know when uh, you're going to meet a potential new uh, owner. And it's very important to have that mindset. So for you to be getting this experience so early in your career and to have a similar um, exposure in your prior job, I think is going to make you such a really, really valuable employee and uh, firm owner in your future. So uh, kudos to you and having had this opportunity. And I think it's just the first page of your success story. So great job. Thank you so much. Um, so now let's jump into your volunteer role at Madam Architect. How did you get acquainted to Madam Architect and what, uh, you know, what drew you to become a volunteer there? Yeah. So for those who don't know, Madam Architect is a digital magazine and media startup that celebrates the extraordinary woman um, shaping our world. So we aim to um, showcase the stories of women in architecture and just provide, provide insight on the different choices that women have um, within their careers in architecture. So you don't have to stick to the limited um, architects with a capital A um, story. You can, you can build your own story. Um, and so my first interaction with Madam Architect actually came in 2022 when I attended the AIA National Conference um, in Chicago. And I actually didn't plan to attend the session, but Julia was, um, Julia Gamalina, who's the editor in chief and founder of Madam Architect, she was presenting um, in the middle of the, the expo, you know, the, the large materials expo that has all right. the different vendors and everything there. She was doing a small presentation off to the side um, in like this open space and it was very loud and I just happened to be walking by and I just felt compelled to sit in her session. Um, and I was hooked. She, she was presenting on all the different women that she's interviewed in the past and was talking a little bit about her team as well. Um, and so after her session, I just went up to ask her a few questions um, and I really wanted to know how I could help with Madam Architect in any way. But in my head, I was thinking, I was like, oh, like, She's just going to say, oh, like, send this to your friends, like, share it with other students that you know, share the platform um, through social media. Um, but a few days later, um, we were talking and she asked me to join her team. So I'm, I'm now her, 
her editor, editorial assistant, and I have been for almost two years now. So it's been great to be on the team. That's very, very exciting to uh, be able to work with such an inspirational woman on a regular basis. Um, I know that uh, the content that they put out has really been uh, trajectory changing for so many uh, women architects. So that's a very, very exciting experience for you. And uh, congratulations on um, two years there. That's really yeah. wonderful. Thank Fantastic. You. Um, what are your responsibilities as editorial assistant? I prepare different materials for interviews to prepare them for um, the editor in chief to, to update them. And I keep the website up to date. And I'm also in charge of our archives. So I make sure that everyone that we've featured is documented properly. And I just keep things um, running smoothly. We also recently launched an event series called Madam Architect Presents where we interview women within the spaces that they've designed um, or had a role in creating. And so I help a lot at those events and make sure that um, everyone who's registered gets into the event and just keep things running smoothly there. So that's, that's that. That oh, sounds I very also, yeah. I also should mention that Madam Architect recently won the AA New York um, Architecture and Media Award. Um, so that's it's a really great, um, great award to have won. That's fantastic. And for a media award, that directly is related to the work that you are doing for Madam Architect. So congratulations. Yeah. That's excellent. Um, how do you believe that Madam Architect is changing the way that women practice architecture? I think that Madam Architect allows women to have uh, a lot of perspective. As I mentioned before, the platform gives women a myriad of different choices of, um, of ways that they can take their career. So it really helps them take ownership of how they want their careers to look. Instead of just following a traditional path, they can really embrace their passions and implement them into their own careers. So, and also since our articles and um, and different media is like completely accessible and free to people online. Like really anyone can interact with our platform. And I think that's also what's really special about Madam Architect. Excellent. Um, during your time with Madam Architect or even before, if it's applicable, uh, what do you, what interview do you think was most influential to you or would be most influential to um, your peers or who, what interview would you direct a peer to? Yeah, it's a great question. There's definitely a lot of them. Um, one that we did recently that really stands out to me, it was with uh, Naisha, and she um, she calls herself an activist, which is like an architect that's also an activist. And so I think that inter interview was really interesting and definitely worth looking into. And then also we interviewed Sandra and... Maya Madison of Robert P. Madison. They're a mother-daughter duo, and I, I love that interview as well. I think that's worth looking into. A while back, we interviewed Kimberly Dowdell, who is the current AIA um, national president, um, and her story is also impeccable and worth looking into. Um, so definitely not one, so definitely so many, but um, I guess one that really stands out to me also is with Renee Chang, um, and she's an educator. And I really admire her story because she, I think she started out as pre-med in college and she shifted into architecture. And then she also was a ceramicist like growing up. And so she really found ways to embrace her passions. And then later she um, was more focused on educating. Um, so during her, um, during her time in college, she was an educator and then she started her own firm and then she went back to being an educator and she's really um, impactful in the architectural education world. Excellent, thank you. Um, what are your plans for advancing diversity in AI New Jersey or Madam Architect or the profession? Uh, what what would you like to see uh, set in motion? Um, I'd say one thing that really stands out to me um, currently 
as an emerging architectural professional is that I feel like not a lot of individuals my age are really stepping into leadership roles within AIA and AIA New Jersey. Um, and while I was in college, especially following COVID, I noticed like there was a sense of, um, not explain it, like just, just a low moment for students. Like I feel like they weren't as passionate as they were before. Um, and so I feel like we're really getting back into things. This is just what I've noticed from um, students in my area, but I, I really hope that they're able to step into um, engaging more with AAA New Jersey and different local organizations um, to reignite their passion for architecture. Uh, I'm going to respond to that uh, as a past president of AIA New Jersey and as our equity chair that um, I know over the years I have met with a variety of students or people of color who have come to the organization and felt that the organization was not um, an appropriate role model for them because they didn't see themselves easily reflected in the majority of our population and our activities. And um, while we have made this a high priority for us, getting our emerging professionals involved, engaging our students, uh, making a place for um, people who really have any initiative that they want to bring forward um, to know that, uh, you know, we are extremely welcoming and encouraging to those groups. Um, and we will absolutely provide a support system to students who want to get involved um, or uh, people of color or people of any demographic that feel like they're not finding their subset. Uh, we are excited to embrace you and help you to find a voice and to uh, to lift you up within AI New Jersey. So we are delighted to um, be making this stronger relationship with somebody like you and want all of our listeners to know that uh, you do have a place here in AI New Jersey. And we hope that with your participation, we, we will be able to build up those communities to provide that um uh, mentorship to people coming after you uh, in fulfilling those roles too. So we're so excited to have you here and uh, and to continue to develop our relationship together and to be a support system and a platform for you to bring forward ideas that are important to you and to other students uh, who want to join the organization. So thanks for bringing that up. Absolutely. And I know recently AA New Jersey had a mentorship program. And I think that it would be really great if that initiative uh, vamps up next year. And it really, um, I, because I, I did take part in it. And so I think having it be more in person and having it be more interactive, I know it's tough with us all being in a state that's so far apart at times. Um, but I think there's definitely ways that we can get more people engaged in that program. Excellent. I know that uh, registration for this year's mentorship just opened this week and okay. uh, it's open until March 22nd. Uh, Matthew Pultoric is uh, one of the people who is um, spearheading that process. So uh, for yourself and for anybody else who's participating, we encourage you to uh, look in the newsletter that just came out yesterday for the link to be able to register for this year's process, either as a mentor or a mentee, or to just learn more about it, because maybe you have people that you would like to recommend to get involved. Uh, so thanks for bringing that up, because it's yeah. a, a slowly growing program for us that uh, the people who are participating are finding it really fulfilling. So that's a that's one we're proud of, and we're glad to have you participating. Yeah, very timely that I mentioned that. <laughs> yeah. Um, what are your, uh, professional goals personally? Personally, I feel, I feel like they've been changing a bit recently, but I still envision myself becoming an architect. Um, I've really dived deep into this business development world and I'm looking forward to learning more about strategy and really getting, um, getting really good at putting together RFPs and RQs and understanding procurement. Um, I really love engaging with stakeholders and meeting various uh, clients and just putting together a great team. Um, but I also want to make room for my passions. 
Um, I was a track and field athlete in college, and I want to find a way to embrace that, whether it's just through coaching um, little ones in um, track club over the summer or just just minor um, minor things with that. Um, so not necessarily just professional goals within architecture, but I have a lot of passions and I'd, I'd love to embrace them. Take a look at the Girls Who Run program. There are chapters throughout New Jersey for encouraging young women to run, Girls Who Run. I'll look into that. Thank you. Sure. Um, um, how do you, this one is very near and dear to me, but how do you plan to get more involved in AI in New Jersey? Um, it's a good question. I definitely, I definitely hope to attend more AI New Jersey events. Um, I've started to attend a lot of them, but I definitely want to get more engaged with them. And I don't know, I just foresee, um, I'd like to do more of in-person events where we're like engaging with different students. So if we're able to engage with college students or able to um, set up a program similar to how AIA New York does their um, K through 12 initiatives, like having more workshops where we're teaching different students about architecture, I would love to, to either take the lead on that or just be really um, on a great team that puts together initiatives like that. Great. We do have a K-12 committee in New Jersey, and this year's National Architecture Week, which is April 14th through 20th, is focusing on K-12 initiatives and engaging young people in understanding the uh, power of design and the value of design and understanding what architects do and how uh, young people's awareness of design around them can have a positive influence on themselves and their community. So that is a very, very timely topic. We're so excited to hear your interest. And uh, there's going to be a lot of room to advance that uh, subject. So uh, we look forward to you joining us on some of those uh, upcoming projects, which would be terrific. I also would really love uh, to see you involved with our um, college liaison uh, program that we have. So uh, we have had uh, mentoring sessions, portfolio reviews, pizza parties uh, with some of the New Jersey colleges that have architecture and design programs. And um, to me, it always seems like a very good time and place to have some young people there who are very fresh as graduates and can uh, really speak to what the current experience is like graduating uh, looking for a job and then finding your way on the path to licensure or whatever it is that you uh, see as your goal in the architecture and design community. So um, lots of room for you, Sydney, to uh, to get more involved. Um, and even, you know, when you're feeling overwhelmed and too busy to get involved, I would say that we still value your feedback and your suggestions and your recommendations. Uh, because those are important things that all of our committees can be acting upon as we continue at AI in New Jersey to try to advance our engagement with emerging professionals like yourself. Uh, so thank you very much. I, I personally found uh, your answers very interesting and engaging, and I'm glad I was able to be the one to interview you today. Um, at this time, I invite any of our participants to enter a question or two into our chat. And uh, I will bring your question to Sydney for um, her response. Feel free to ask me anything. I'm sure. <laughs> see. Also, in the meantime, can you speak a little bit more about things that are coming up in AI in New Jersey? Absolutely. Uh, so right now we're finishing up our Black History Month um, promotion. Uh, that has involved, uh, in particular, covering some of the exciting things going on. Like, for example, uh, one of our big stories this week was um, William Brown III, who is one of our fellows. Uh, he was just recognized last week at the Amistad Gala of the Bug Foundation for his contributions as a Black male educator. Um, and Bill works not only with um, members of AIA New Jersey, but also members of NOMA New Jersey and members of ACE 
And um, he has additional uh, mentorship through um, NAACP. Uh, so there always, always are exciting internship experiences that he has going on. I know that Newark and Suburban right now has a gallery exhibit of um, artwork created by students during the month of December that's now on exhibit. Um, and that is available, if more information on that is available through the Newark and Suburban uh, website. Uh, we also have coming up our Women's History Month program uh, that's kicking off with our first Lunch and Learn tomorrow from 12 until 1. And then there will be two additional Lunch and Learn programs for continuing education credit uh, during the month of, of March. Um, on the 18th, uh, oh, 19th? On March 19th, um, I am going to be chairing as the uh, Equity uh, Diversity and Inclusion Committee Chair um, a networking event with Arcatina, who are the Latina members of the design community, Noma, New Jersey, um, and uh, AIA New Jersey. All of those um, members are invited free of charge to Ulrich Inc. in Ridgewood, New Jersey. Um, they have parking and it's also walking distance to the train for anyone who wants to come in on the train. And that's going to be uh, a two hour networking event on Tuesday, the 19th of March. Um, and information is coming out on that event. And um, then on Thursday, March 28th, I will be hosting an event similar to this, uh, interviewing Nancy Doherty, who, you know, it's our my friend. My former Nancy. boss. Yeah, That's right. I love Nancy. <laughs> um, Nancy this year is the architect of the year. Um, and I didn't realize that you had so recently worked at her firm. So uh, it's very timely for the two of you to be connected as uh, award recipients for AI New Jersey. But we will be doing a, a lunch interview like this with Nancy on Thursday, the 28th of March. And then, of course, our sections are constantly having phenomenal in-person um, dinner meetings and building tours and all kinds of good stuff coming up. So I hope that everybody will be following along with um, the newsletter and the website and um, your constant contact emails from the organization to uh, register for what's new. Um, Sydney, I am so excited to have had this opportunity to talk to you today. Um, I don't see any follow-up questions from our participants. Well, we, we did get a few questions in. I don't know if you can. I don't do see it, but I can. Then I go I'll, ahead and open I'll read them off. Um, yeah. Samantha, who's a former classmate of mine, she mentioned yeah. the ACE mentorship program and it's a high school mentorship program where um, that she's involved in and they mentor different students in architecture, construction, and engineering. And I've, I've heard of it, it's a great program. Um, I actually know a couple of students who um, were interested in, in NJIT who came through that program. So it's definitely a positive program. Is, to is engage she with. bringing it up? Is she mentioning it because she's looking for more volunteers or? Um, she just told me to check it out. So I will. Oh. I'll check it out and everyone else should as well. Excellent. Um, I'm sure they need more mentors as well. Um, and then Christina Owens, she says, hello, I'm a second year architecture student at NJIT. I was wondering, how do you find the confidence to move forward with your design if you get a negative review? This was something that I struggled with at the beginning of college. Um, I think what people always told me was that you have to think about it as they're critiquing your design, it's not a critique of you as a person. Um, so you really have to step back. And I actually run into the same, the same thing um, in my business development role currently, because I bring pursuits to the table and I do all of this great research about different projects that I feel would be a good fit for the firm. And I bring it to the table and I tell them all these things about the project. And then you have to really keep in mind that it's not, <laughs> If they say no to the project, it's not about you. It's not about how you presented it. It's just not the right fit for the firm. Um, so just think about it that way. They're just giving you a critique to, so that you can move forward in the best way possible. Um, I'm gonna also mention before the next question that uh, keep in mind that when you transition from a designer in college to being a designer in the profession, um, at that point, your client really holds all the cards. So even though it's up to you to be um, creating the design that suits that project, um, 
ultimately you have to make sure that they are happy. So it's right. very important to uh, to be able to overcome, um, you know, your personal uh, reflection of of that design because you know we're not psychic as designers. We can right. only interpret the information that the client is giving us. So um, different from the feedback that you're getting on a design jury in school, your client maybe is not able to really articulate what they want. And so you are designing something in response to your interpretation of the information they provided. And if you completely blow it and they hate what you've designed, it's merely, um, you know, a communication situation. So um, you need to encourage them to use a variety of tools to better communicate to you. Maybe there's an inspiration Pinterest or uh, there's a questionnaire that you put together to try to pull out from them what, uh, you know, kinds of ideas that they have in mind. And that will help to inform what it is that you're working on. Yeah. I remember those visioning sessions, you pull together all these different things and like, you're asking the client and they're like, oh, I don't know, I like this. I don't know if I like this. And you really just have to <laughs> keep engaging with them until you, you get an answer out of them. So. That's right. Great advice. And then we have a question from Christy, uh, Christy Doherty. She says, hi, I'm curious if you ran into any adversity on your path through school uh, or professionally and how you overcame that. Um, she says, as a woman in the field for a decade and a half, I've had moments of being uh, held back in the profession due to my gender in some early environment. So I'm always curious on how other individuals kept on going and always proceeding with your passions without wearing you down. It's definitely a hard thing um, being a woman in, in architecture. Um, I guess first speaking about while I was in school, um, I, I did struggle with a lot of adversity while I was in school, not necessarily um, based on my identity, uh, but I being both an athlete and within architecture was um, was really mentally draining. I like being fully transparent about it. It was it was really tough to um, to get through it all and always keep a smile on my face and and get through things. But having the support of different teammates and um, certain classmates was really what what kept me going throughout school. And I'm so happy that I made it through. Um, and, and, and being in Mar Madam Architect, reading past stories of other people who've had tr like trouble um, going through their ar architectural education, it made me feel like I wasn't alone. Um, and I really wish I had read Madam Architect articles while I was in college. It would really would have lifted my spirits um, throughout all of that. Um, and professionally, uh, I have experienced a lot of... Um, I haven't been in the professional world that long yet, but I have experienced some adversity. Um, and sometimes being a black woman can be really lonely um, in architecture. There's there's not a lot of us. And is it still less than 1% of the architects are, are black women? I think that's the statistic. Um, so it's definitely really hard to, to stay engaged and really want to um, to increase the number of black women in architecture. Um, but one thing that keeps me going is obviously these great organizations like AIA and NOMA who really produce such great mentors for me to speak to at any time. Um, and I stay engaged with them. Um, so there, there have been moments where I felt like low, but um, just having great mentorship around me has kept me going. Oh, and then the other part um, about proceeding with your your other passions. Um, I'm a big um, advocator for really making time for work-life balance. And I know the standard within architecture is, oh, work till you're like, till you're dead, essentially, like keep, keep going and keep going and work all of these hours. But honestly, like, you have to make time for what matters to you. So if it's, if it's 
six thirty, seven o'clock on a Friday and you have something that you really need to get to, you have children that you need to see, like and <laughs> and need to go to a soccer game for your child, you have to go. Like it's architecture, it will be here. It's not it's not um you're not at a hospital, like people aren't dying, like you have to make space for what matters um in your Absolutely life. Absolutely right. And luckily, uh, the trend in business now is having greater respect for work-life balance. Right. Um, you know, firm owners and principals are realizing that um, staff having time to recharge and to uh, be able to spend time doing things they're passionate about makes them more effective when they're at work anyway. So, you know, keeping people around until they're in burnout mode makes them resentful and uncooperative. And so it's bad for everybody. Right. Um, so I think that's a great question. Uh, it's not to say that every firm is operating in that direction, but really if a firm is constantly in crisis mode and everybody's working overtime all the time, I mean, that's really an indicator of some mismanagement somewhere on, on the project side, or maybe mismanagement of the client's expectations, because as you say, um, you know, we're not putting out fires. We're not, uh, saving people from having a heart attack. Uh, yes, there are sometimes deadlines that we have a planning board meeting or, um, you know, there are sometimes deadlines, but very often uh, architects are asked to work towards a deadline and then the client sits around for three weeks after that anyway. So um, it's and, you know, as a project manager and as an office manager, uh, it's important to um, be able to ferret out when the real crises are. And that way you're using people's resources effectively and not, um, you know, wasting people's time, always having a crisis when it really doesn't exist. So uh, I think that's an important question to even ask uh, at a job interview. You know, how often are people working overtime at this firm and uh, how does the firm manage those kinds of crisis situations? Because usually uh, the week before you have an idea when there's a deadline coming up and you can allocate the proper resources to that. I will also mention that the mentorship program that we're talking about, while most of the people who sign up for that are uh, looking for mentorship through getting their license, that is open to anyone of any phase of their career and any um, type of mentorship that they're looking for. Uh, also, as we head into our Women in Architecture Month, I know we have a networking event on March 4th at Princeton University, which will be for all types of women in construction. And that'll be a great place. That's a free event for all AIA New Jersey members, a great place to go and meet other women that you can um, relate to, commiserate with, maybe find a mentor there, as well as the event at, um, at uh, Ulridge, where we're going to have um, women from uh, three different organizations from many walks of life. So those are two great places that any of our listeners uh, will be able to meet potential mentors. Um, and even if it's not a long-term relationship, we can talk about some of those situations live at the event and see if we can reach some resolution for you. But I will say as a woman in industry for 30 years, that um, one of my greatest things to have in my toolbox was for me to be confident. So um, if I don't know the answer to the question, I confidently say that is a great question. I'm writing it down right now and I'm going to look into that. Um, and if it's a question, you know, so I, I try to go to meetings prepared. And if something comes up that uh, I'm, I'm not aware of or um, not able to answer at the time, I confidently offer my ability to pursue that further. Um, Usually I find that if I believe in myself, the people around me also believe in me. Uh, yeah, so true. if I head into a situation where I'm reluctant or I anticipate that um, that I'm not going to be able to accomplish what I need to at that meeting, then often that uh, apprehension comes through and creates that um, that ineffective dynamic. So, uh, you know, meditation and uh you know, uh, self-motivation is really goes a long way in helping you to portray confidence and uh, then have having other people uh, believe in you and have confidence in you. And we certainly can put together a program specifically on that. Uh, some of the programs that we have coming up for, for women in uh, Women's History Month, uh, the three lunch and learns coming up, talk about leadership. The one tomorrow specifically is about cultivating leadership. 
So uh, that's a great one for uh, people that are on the, this call who may have questions in that arena and registration is still available for that event tomorrow. Amazing. All right. And on the, on the topic of that networking event that you mentioned, I recently attended a speed networking. Um, well, I think actually it was called speed mentoring at AI in New York, and it was with the Women in Architecture Committee, and that was a really successful event. And a lot of the women there were very deep into their careers, and they were looking for mentors. So, Christy, you can absolutely show up at any of these events. Don't think about it as you being deep into your career. Just there's mentors for you that are out there still. Absolutely. Um, and then I just want to finalize. Um, my last question is with Mark Bess, who was a mentor of mine at NJIT. He says, hello, Sydney, congrats. He says he's the new AIA uh, Newark and Suburban Liaison for HCAD, um, which is the Hillary College of Architecture and Design. And he's a NOMAS advisor at NJIT. Um, he said that we would love to have me back at the school sometime, which I, I would love to come back. And he says, we're planning to take a student group to NOMA, the NOMA conference in October. He said, am I interested in mentoring? And I absolutely am. And I would love to come back to the school and would also love to attend the NOMA conference with these students. So great. Wonderful, wonderful. Mark is always such a huge supporter of uh, AI New Jersey programs and uh, all of our students and uh, recent grads. So I'm so glad that he was able to tune in and be a part of the program today. Excellent. Oh, let's see. Uh... I just got another message here. I just want to check if we didn't miss anything. Let's see. The Stop Overworking Formula for Women Architects is a program by AIA Central New Jersey. Um, the link to register for that um, is on the Central New Jersey website and also was available in the newsletter this week. Um, let's see. Excellent. And okay. I think that covered everything that I have. Anything else, Sydney? Any parting words for our audience? Um, we say just get involved more with AIA. Attend the conferences. You never know who you're going to meet. And it, it may really change your life. And I encourage everybody, um, there are so many different organizations that you can become a part of, uh, whether it's AIA, whether it's Architina, whether it's NOMA, whether it's a local organization, whether it's an alumni group through your school. Uh, but it's always important to connect with other people, uh, find someone that you can talk to about what's working well, what's not working, um, and uh, you know, make those connections. That's always going to be a way to build your confidence and build your future. And that networking group is always going to be um, your safety net and also your um, your cheering audience. So you want to develop those relationships and continue to strengthen those. Sydney, I can't uh, thank you enough for being a part of the program today. Uh, it's been my delight to meet you and to have the opportunity to interview you today. Um, I want to remind everyone uh, our next event like this one will be Thursday, March 28th. Uh, we will be interviewing Nancy Doherty, who is the Architect of the Year for AIA New Jersey. And uh, that program will be a very similar format to today. So, Sydney, thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for having me, Stacey. Absolutely. And thank you to our audience. You guys have been terrific. Goodbye, everyone. Bye.